Hello and welcome to another episode here on Viking TV with me, Anne Diamond. I'm here today in Covent Garden, home of the famous flower market of the Royal Opera House and nowadays world-class dining and shopping. And I'm here at a family business that's been going for a couple of hundred years, always in the same family, and has become very, very famous for maps. In fact, Stanford's is the largest retailer of maps in the entire world. They say that if it exists anywhere on the planet, Stanford's will find you a map of it. So famous that it's even become written into literary folklore. At one point in The Hound of the Baskervilles, Sherlock Holmes turns to Watson and says, get down to Stanford's and get a map of Dartmoor. Of course, that's not real life, but it does make its mark in real life adventure. Too. You would have had really famous names like Ernest Shackleton or Captain Scott of the Antarctic or even Florence Nightingale. They would often come here. Nowadays you get names that might be a bit more familiar like Ranulph Fiennes or Levison Wood um, or Michael Palin. They would come here to plot their next big adventure. So if you're a travel writer, you really want your book on one of these bookshelves. And that's why I want you to meet today a remarkable young man who's done just that. Let's meet Ash Bardwaj. So Ash, you've written a book about it. You've asked the question. Let me ask it of you. Why do we travel? I think there's a lot of different reasons to travel. And for me, exploring this was about making my own travel more fulfilling. Because at the end of COVID, obviously I hadn't travelled for two years. Mm -hmm. We then had a daughter, Lyra, and so that has constrained the travel that I can do. So if I was going to travel less, how do I make each journey more fulfilling? Oh, you've got to justify it now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not just justified, but it's also, I think if you are travelling less, you really want to get the most out of it. And so much travel marketing and travel influencer content is based entirely around hedonism. So it's just having fun yeah. or just relaxing. But when I looked back on my career in travel as a journalist, as a soldier, as a teacher, as a student, I traveled for lots of different reasons at different times. So it's trying to pick out those 12 different reasons why we travel. Yeah, I mean, you, it's hardly hedonistic doing all the walking you've done. <laughs> miles and miles and miles of walking. And, and, and extraordinary things you've actually made yourself do or wanted to do. That's not hedonistic. That's that's being curious? I think curiosity is the root motivation of all travel. So the reason why humans are the most successful species on the planet is our ancestors wanted to look over the horizon. They needed to do to find new environments, new habitats, new resources, and then we were also able to adapt to our environment. So every other animal has to evolve for its environment. Humans can figure out how to build a shelter in the jungle or how to hunt a specific animal and use its furs to keep warm. That ability to learn and share that knowledge is rooted in curiosity. So it's very human to be curious, both to discover and to learn. And for me, it was curiosity that drove me into travel back when I first did a, an overseas adventure when I was 17. And that has really kept me going ever since. Yeah, it's amazing because um, curiosity is something that comes up time and again in Viking because Torstein Hagen, um, chairman of Viking, believes that most people who travel with him travel because they're curious travellers. They want to know more. They don't... It's very nice being in, on a luxury ship. It's lovely going to a beautiful place and sitting on a fantastic beach. Um, but most of our travellers want more. They want to know about the culture and why people are the way they are. What is the most standout, this is really unfair question, what is the most standout place for you you've ever been so far? There's a couple that come to mind, but the place that I think has had the biggest impact on me as someone who travels was New Zealand. My mum had visited New Zealand in the 1970s, see family. And when I was 17, my school which is Windsor Boys, local state school, was running a rugby tour to Australia, New Zealand and the Cook Islands. Mum got a second job as a cleaner to pay for my ticket to get me out there. And I had to learn how to play rugby, which if you haven't ever done it, it's quite a challenging thing to do. Got out to New Zealand and the thing that I really noticed 
was the prominence of New Zealand's indigenous Maori culture, which you don't see the equivalent of in Australia. The no, First don't. Nations people just aren't prominent in Australian culture. You know, and it's been a struggle for New Zealand, and the Maori have had to you know, fight for their rights and representation in society. But what it means is you have this bicultural society. And I in was, what way, though? How does that manifest itself? You see Maori people. You get off the plane in Auckland Airport, and the signs are in Te Reo Maori. There's Maori art and design all over the place. You interact with Maori people on a daily basis. They're not hidden away on reservations. Um, there was a very different way that Australia treated its Aborigines um, from the way that the Maori were treated in New Zealand, wasn't it? And, and it's developed differently too. Absolutely, and it, it, it's rooted in the way we, the British, colonised the two places differently. Uh, the way we classified, and that's such an awful term, classified indigenous people. The way we settled the two countries differently. And I was curious, I was like, why, you know, the first question I had is why, why are the Maori prominent here, but the First Nations people of Australia are not? And those are the answers. It's all those sorts of things. You know, you meet Kiwis and they'll often say Kiora. They won't say hello. Kiora is a Maori greeting. And so that interest and um, that curiosity about why are these two places so different drove my desire to return again and again and ask questions. And, you know, I was traveling with a bunch of other rugby players and most of them, uh, most of us, just wanted to drink beer and, yeah. um, and have fun. And I enjoyed doing that as well. But I, I really was probably of the group, the one that was more likely to go up and say to people, so why is it like this? Why is it like that? What, why do you guys do this? And so maybe I had some inherent curiosity, which probably came from watching a lot of Star Trek when I was younger. Um, but I do think curiosity is something that can be cultivated. If you think ahead about where you're going to travel, what are the things about that place that is different? Mm -hmm. And when you get there, keep asking those questions. There'll be a reason, won't there? Yeah. Have you, what do you, what, as you've travelled, what do you think of the peoples? Are they, is, the, is hospitality a natural thing? Do people naturally want to welcome you? Or are there some very different reactions in different cultures? I think some of the reactions in different places are a product of history. Some is cultural. I've found different places to be much more welcoming than others. Uh, I found generations can be quite different as well. I, I traveled through Russia in 2018. I didn't find it a particularly hospitable place. Mm -hmm. I traveled through Ukraine in the same year. I found it an incredibly hospitable place, you know, and those are two countries that have links in history um, and often and, links in families. And links in families. But they've developed differently, you think. And there'll be a reason why, won't there? The identity and personhood of those two nations are very separate. You go to Ukraine, there is a real sense of pride about almost what they're not. They're not Russian, that they're aligned to Europe, that there is this real sense of identity that appeared in 2014 when they threw off um, Russian influence in their politics. Whereas if you go to Russia, I think there's much more a sense of uh, why, why do we need to be nice to you because we're a great nation? And I think those sort of cultural means do pass through in places. I mean, that's a level that you've walked as well, what you call the new um, Iron Curtain area. You've actually walked the length of it. Which countries did you go through? I'd love to have walked the length of it, but I did take a train. A length quite of it. it. <laughs> yeah. right. um, so I, well, I'd, got, I'd been with the army in Estonia as an army reservist in 2017 for an operation called Opkabrit. And the whole reason we were there was because Russia had invaded and occupied Crimea and Donbass in 2014. So there's this sort of deterrence mission. And I became curious about the legacy of Russian occupation in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, in fact. So I decided to, as, as a travel journalist does, set out and travel the entire length of that fault line. So it's Norway, right up at the top of a place called Kirkenes. Uh, we probably see it on a map. Um, we, we literally have globes here for this. Um, we do. Oh, uh, here it is, this side. So all the way up here, Kirkenes in Norway, up in the Arctic, Finland, in through St. Petersburg. Wow. Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Kaliningrad, which is a little spot of Russia, Poland, um, Belarus, and then down into Ukraine. That is one hell of a journey. Yeah, it was great fun. 
Now, again, you, it's interesting you're talking about that. You just decided. <laughs> but you're married now and you've got a child. Will that curb your enthusiasm for travel? So Lyra is now 20 months old. And when she was four months old, we took her to New Zealand. So I think half of it is what you want and half of it is just backing yourself. Can you travel with a child? Being a travel journalist, that reduces a lot of our costs. Oh, I can see the next book. For a travel journalist, for somebody who obviously at some point just decided and went, um, now you've got to plan and you've got to take stuff with you. So that's the thing, definitely. It's taking stuff with us. You've got to take a lot of stuff. But also you have to, you know, when I was four months old, she didn't require a schedule. She didn't require too much planning. It's just mm. like, oh, she'll fall asleep and she'll... You know, Feed on breast milk. Yeah, I mean, that's how people used to travel with children, yes. Yeah, it's quite easy. Now mm. that she's nearly two years old, um, she wants to watch Paddington Bear. Mm. So, you know, there's lots of different constraints that didn't exist before. In terms of what that means to me, you know, my wife and I are pretty good about making sure that each of our careers are still looked after. She's a doctor. Um, that's a bit more difficult when I need to go away for a couple of weeks at a yeah. time. I certainly do do it less, but it does mean that I'm changing the way I travel. So I probably travel less far. I, I try to travel a lot more in Europe, but I think... Less dangerously? I, I wouldn't say I've always, I've ever really traveled particularly dangerously. I've tried to do fairly good risk assessments and reduce the risk. I mean, I guess... But walking miles and miles and miles and miles and miles in intense heat, that's a danger now. 52 degrees, I think it was when you were with Leveson Wood, <laughs> yeah. you were walking through which particular desert it was. That was the Bayuda Desert. So we were in Africa. Lev was walking the entire length of the River Nile and I joined him for Uganda and Sudan. And yeah, we crossed the Bayuda Desert in Sudan. And it was an odd occurrence because we hadn't planned on walking through the desert, but the Sudanese security forces didn't wa want us walking in a particular region. So we had to go across the desert. It was hot. But what we discovered along the way was something we couldn't have planned if we'd have taken a normal route. There was a guy just sat in a cafe who's asking us, what are you two doing? Well, we're walking across the Bayou de Desert. He laughed. And then said, well, if you're going this way, you should go and check out this Catabas Festival. We never heard of the Catabas Festival. We called the researchers from the TV program. They didn't know what it was either. And it's basically this huge gathering of Sufi Muslims in this town called Kadabas to celebrate, I think, the Prophet Muhammad's ascension to heaven. I can't remember the specific details. And we just turned up and observed it. And we were welcomed in and we were shown around and they were explaining what everything is, given a feast. There was this amazing dancing going on in this square of this, in the courtyard of a mosque. Uh, it was just remarkable. And if we hadn't have changed our route, hadn't bumped into this guy, hadn't seen this, uh, seen this route, we wouldn't have encountered it. And it was very special. In the middle of a desert, yeah. this town that we just But you wouldn't have encountered it. You wouldn't have written about it. You wouldn't be telling me about it now. That's how word spreads, isn't it? I wouldn't have known about it. Yeah, And, and now I've seen the video of it. <laughs> That's serendipity. You the video of it, yeah. yeah. You ended up videoing a lot of your travels now. You've, you've had to learn all about that, the technical side of it. I think there's two parts of that. One is that early on it was the way I got to travel places. So when I was with Lev, I was the cameraman. So having that skill got me somewhere with a friend of mine to go and do this journey. And then for me now, as I'm doing stuff as a journalist and a broadcaster, a lot of the time you have to self-shoot, particularly for travel newspapers and travel magazines, like the algorithm is hungry for content. Mm. So you know, I've been doing it from behind the camera, but now I'm doing a bit more front of camera stuff as well. Yeah. What about your pinch me moments? There must have been, I mean, I, I've been trying to think what mine were. My, mine was seeing Sydney Opera House for the first time. Mm. You, you have to pinch yourself and think, I am actually here. I mean, the pyramids, um, the Northern Lights. What are your pinch me moments? I think you've, you've touched on a few that, uh, that stand out for me. I remember seeing the Northern Lights in Northern Norway when I was doing the journey mm. along the Russian-Ukrainian border when I was doing the journey along the Russian-European border, just the Northern Lights seeing that. But for me, returning to New Zealand and learning more about that place time and time again, every time I go, I find it remarkable. 
down in the South Island, there's a place called Wanaka, and it's on a lake. And just above Wanaka, there's a ski resort called Treble Cone. And from Treble Cone, you can look up the Matakitaki Valley to the Southern Alps mountain range, and you see Mount Aspiring, which is the highest mountain in that range. And it's almost like a geography textbook. You see the U-shaped valley and everything. And it's so beautiful and so stunning that that's my favourite mm -hmm. viewpoint in the world. It was my mum that basically got me to go to New Zealand and when she passed away, I took her ashes to that point to scatter them. So I think that's my favourite viewpoint in the world. Yeah, I, you must shoot a movie there, somebody thought, didn't they? <laughs> I, I mean, I can tell the sort of things you're interested in already. You've already mentioned Star Trek and space. Uh, clearly, um, Lord of the Rings now comes into it. With, uh, with those incredible vistas. Um, and they exist on this planet, don't they? Absolutely amazing. That's where you learned to ski. It, it was. It's where I learned to ski properly. I trained as a ski instructor at Treble Cone in New Zealand. And it was great fun. I was working as a doorman in Wanaka and I played rugby for a bit. And so I did something a bit safer, which was skiing. And uh, yeah. it was a great place to learn how to ski. It's a fairly small mountain. But there's a very strong sense of, I don't know, capability in the wilds in New Zealand. A lot of people are only you know, one generation removed from farms. Mm -hmm. And that just desire to go out hiking in the mountains is very embedded in the culture. So it was a really good place to learn how to ski. Not that there's anything wrong with European skiing, but if you're going to learn how to be in the mountains, New Zealand was a good place. The other place that just jumps out at me that I loved is the Redwood Forests of California. Ah, that's something I've never seen and would oh, love to. It's remarkable. It's, it's both, it's a really good example of where travel can be both beautiful and sad because you've got these reserves and they're big reserves of where the ancient forest is still protected. And just to think that the entire West Coast, a couple hundred miles in land, were these enormous forests that have now been cut down for logging. Mm. And... It's a reminder of just how remarkable the world is, but how easy it is to take for granted. And I think one of the great things about travel is it makes you realise how wonderful and fragile our planet is. And I think that can build a sense of environmentalism. Yes, in yes. Well, that's being curious, and but also knowledgeable. Um, it's interesting you, say, you talk about, um, in, in the book, and, and people ask you, I'm sure they ask you all the time, um, how do you become a travel journalist? How do you get interested in travel? Where do you start? Um, and you say, follow your heroes. And you've got quite a few heroes. I mean, you mentioned Jean-Luc Picard, the captain <laughs> from Star Trek. I don't know if I can get to Wolf 359 and Deep Space Nine and the other places that he did go, but... Yeah, but well, you try. Yeah. <laughs> what do you like about his character then? I liked his sense of determination, um, his sense of empathy. I think empathy and kindness are underrated qualities in leadership. Um, but it was his curiosity and his mm. discovery, mm. just going out. Well, seeing, that was their job, wasn't it? They, yeah. They, it, it wasn't a military craft, was it? It was its job was exploration, which is quite cool. You, I can see you in the uniform. Um, <laughs> Churchill, you bring up. I saw you doing a schools lecture, um, and you you talked. J.K. Rowling came up, um, and you admire her. Yeah, and I, because she got on with it. And I think they're all quite different. You know, different heroes do different things. The we look to heroes as sort of models of behavior like I do with Johnny Picard or Benjamin Sisko from Deep Space Nine and you know you've got fictional heroes and real life heroes what's interesting about the notion of a hero is really they're all fictionalized even if they're people that existed in the real world because you create a version of them um, what I have enjoyed about bringing heroes into travel is following in the footsteps of people that have gone before me yeah and follow me tell me about the World War Two mission the you, you literally followed in the footsteps of what was that all about? So during World War II, I didn't know this. I was at a travel event where I had just delivered a talk about walking the Nile. And somebody came up to me and said, have you ever thought about going to Albania? Like, this was 2015. I mean, it's a big tourist destination now. 
Yeah, but the answer to that is where is well Albania? Well, Most I, people don't know. Yeah, and I was just like, I've never, I've, yeah, I've never thought about going there on a, on a trip. And this guy said, what about going there to follow in the footsteps of a secret World War II mission? Mm. And immediately I was like, this sounds interesting. And again, I think that's a really, just reflecting on that sentence or two there, it's a really indicative part of travel. It's not the destination, it's the stories yes. and discoveries you can make. Yeah. Which is why I suggest that people think about why you travel before where. And with Albania, there was a secret World War II mission to basically disrupt German lines between Greece and Yugoslavia. And they parachuted people in and they just went around Albania disrupting German supply routes. What year would that have been? 1943 was oh. the main year of activity. Yeah. And they eventually parachuted in a guy called Brigadier Edmund Trotsky Davies. It's called Trotsky it's quite Davies. Quite a name. Yeah. I, 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 the, the, I think the Trotsky came because he was just sort of quite a disciplinarian. You've got to follow the rules of what the party lays down, the party being the British Army in that case. And he got discovered. And so he spent about two months being pursued by the Germans and the Albanian collaborators through the mountains of central Albania and eventually got captured. And I went and followed in his route. And obviously, I'm not going to have the same experience as Trotsky Davis, I would hope. I'm not going to be pursued by Albanians with rifles. And it, he was doing it in the middle of winter. A cross-country skiing, then? He did it all on foot. Oh. He did it all on foot in the middle of winter. With, you know, he, he and his troop, about seven or eight people from his staff. So I followed the route on foot in summer. Um, no snow. And stayed in some of the places that he and his crew had stayed in old farmhouses, t camping on hillsides, and just getting food from cafes in small Albanian villages. It was remarkable. And that story took me there, but what I discovered was something else, mm. which was the hospitality, friendliness, and beauty of the Albanian countryside. So I think heroes can be a reason to start looking at a place. And then you can just make your own way yeah. and find something Stories. of your own as well yeah and storytelling is something you love to do i know a lot of people say that um they imagine travel writing is all about or go you know sort of tips and places to go and hotels to stay at but what you you seem to do is is um try and find a really interesting story to tell or maybe it just comes comes at you from nowhere about where you've been and the people you've met and i think you either get the stories before you go or you discover stories whilst you're going. So... Well, tell me about Arsenal. Ah, so now, this was th a story. There's a story, yeah. This was a story that I did not expect to yeah. find. Uh, bear in mind, a lot of people who watch this programme don't know what Arsenal is either. <laughs> They're not British, so you'll have to explain the whole thing. So, Lev and I were walking through Uganda, uh, so sort of Central East Africa. And as we travelled north, I just kept seeing this appearance everywhere and it took me a little while to figure it out if you travel through africa any part of africa lots of young men are wearing football shirts and it took me a while to figure out in uganda that there was a disproportionate number of people wearing the football shirts of one particular team from north london arsenal, arsenal. this is 2014 arsenal had not won anything for 13 14 years so it's not like manchester united that everybody knows Arsenal was not a particularly successful team at the time. Exactly so. Now, if, I'd, if it had been Manchester United everywhere or Manchester City, which were quite good at the time, and Chelsea, all these teams that had won stuff recently, I might have understood it. But why were people wearing new Arsenal shirts? You know, they weren't wearing Arsenal shirts from 13 years ago. They were wearing this season's Arsenal shirt, even though Arsenal weren't winning things. I thought this was a very confusing and unexpected turn of events. So I started to ask people. Why are you wearing Arsenal shirts? And it turns out the reason is that when the Premier League, which is the English National Football League, the highest level, started to be broadcast internationally, Arsenal were the best team. And there were a couple of things about them. They didn't lose a football game for a long time. They played a very attacking style of football under a manager called Arsene Wenger, who was quite innovative. And they had a lot of players of African origin in their team. So if these young men in the early 2000s watching football, they looked at Arsenal and they were successful, they were fun, they were exciting, but they also had players that looked like them. 
So that developed an affinity for them, from them towards Arsenal, which carried on down through their sons and so on through their families. And so turning up 13 years later, that loyalty still existed in Uganda towards mm-hmm. Arsenal. What it then allowed me to do is then ask them about the rest of their lives. What's it like living in Masindi? What's it like living in the Luo regions of northern Uganda? How's it different to the capital? And I learned about ethnic divisions in Uganda. I learned about the legacy of Joseph Kony and the Lord's Resistance Army, which ravaged the lands of the north. It was a sort of insurgency group. And I learned about their life fishing on the lake and the problems they had with the Ugandan Wildlife Authority. But it was this moment of serendipity of noticing Mm. that it was Arsenal. And the only reason I know anything about Arsenal is because my best friend, who, you know, our mothers went to antenatal class together, he's bored me about Arsenal for my entire life. (laughs) And had it not been for that, I wouldn't have known anything about Arsenal. You wouldn't have noticed so much. That's astonishing, isn't it? But it's it's wonderful. Um, And there are other stories, like, isn't there a part of um, Costa Rica where... If you live in Costa Rica, in that particular part, Western, I think it is, um, you, you could live... They've got the longest lived population, basically. And, again, your curiosity made you ask why. So this is a story I came across before I went travelling. And Costa Rica is what's known as a blue zone. So there's five places around the world where you're more likely to live into healthy old age than anywhere else on the planet. Oh, I didn't know there were blue zones. You'll have to tell us of the others. Well, unfortunately, London is not one of them. No. Um, One is Okinawa, Japan. I think Sardinia. There's another island. I think it might be Santorini. There's a place outside LA. Really? Yeah. um, A community that lives outside LA. They don't drink. They don't eat much meat. And uh, they live in the California sunshine. And the other one is the Nicoya Peninsula of Costa Rica. And some researchers tried to figure out what are all the causes of these things? What's the commonalities? And it's ones that you'd expect. Don't eat too much meat. Have lots of vegetables. Get lots of sunshine. Do lots of activity. But then there's other things that are a bit more abstract. So having a sense of purpose in your life. Oh. A sense of community. Often it's spirituality of some, of some form. And I just wanted to go there and see this place. What, what is this like? And... Mm. You know, you can't just turn up as a tourist, spend two weeks filling yourself with superfoods and then you're going to live an extra five years. But I wanted to go and visit there. And so we were discovering these different parts and chatting to people who were telling us about all these things and saying, you know, you can't just turn up and eat superfoods for a week. You have to have a, a, a complete life. And uh, a guy said, oh, actually, I know a centenarian. Uh, here's his address. I'll give him a call and let him know you're coming. And we turned up. I was with my now wife. And... Uh, we arrived at his house and his granddaughter answered the door. Uh, his granddaughter was in her 60s. What? And, oh. <laughs> and um, she said, oh, sorry, he's uh, Pachito, his name. He's not here at the moment. He's out riding his horse. And he was out visiting his friends on his horse. And then he came back and he said, oh, don't tie the horse up. Deftly dismounted and said, oh, sorry, I'm a bit late. I had to go and visit my friends, you know, they're getting on a bit. He was 100 years old. My goodness. <laughs> so what's the secret? Or isn't there? It, well, just li- go live there, live well, their lifestyle. Go and live in Costa Rica. I, yeah. I mean, I don't think that's a bad call. No, I don't think it? that's a very bad call either. Um, Pachito said, uh, you need to stay active. Don't eat too much meat. Uh, he used to be a cowboy, which is why he's so good at riding horses. Uh, and he also said to me, you need to love a good woman. Oh, that's and, nice. And I married well, the woman. you ticked a lot of those boxes already, because <laughs> not only have you married a good woman, um, but you, uh, you're a cowboy as well, or you have been. I mean, I have ridden horses in Australia in the out. Where you get called, not a cowboy, but a... Jackaroo. A jackaroo. I wasn't very good at it, Anne. Uh, I even have a scar to prove it. Oh, nasty one, yeah. Um, I tried it for a while. Um, yeah, spent a week in Toowoomba General Hospital, and then... Uh, went to New Zealand to play rugby and ski instead. And, yeah, I loved it. I mean, I love horse riding. It's really great fun. And I think in those big open expanses, just being on a horse, galloping across fields, uh, or over open terrain is wonderful. It's a a lovely thing to do. I desperately want to talk to you about um, your 
pilgrimage, if that's the right word, yeah. to take your father's ashes back. But we need to explain first who your father was and what he meant to you. In other words, what sort of childhood you had? My dad was a remarkable and difficult person. He migrated to the UK from India back when that was an easy thing to do in the 60s. And he'd grown up under the empire in India, or the end of empire. His father had worked on the railways and all those sorts of things. And he was the only one of his, he was one of 10. He was the only one to develop a British accent. So he came over to the UK, had a British accent, was the only one to marry a white person, oh. my mum. Mm -hmm. And he set up a restaurant. So he was you know, quite a remarkable character for being very different from the background that he came from. And ran a bar and a restaurant in Windsor and he was an alcoholic. And he wasn't very present in my life and I kind of resented him. I very much view all the best things that came to me from my mum. You know, she raised us largely alone, uh, mostly in social housing for the second half of my childhood. So you weren't rich? Uh, definitely not, you know. When I went on the rugby tour, mum was already working as a cleaner and she got a second job to, to cover that. Um, yeah, and you know, my travels when I was young were very much just around the UK, around those sorts of areas. And my dad, being an alcoholic and running bars, used to sort of gamble on pool and stuff and lose money, and I resented him for it. And yet, at the same time, he gave me life. And at the same time, he also gave me an Indian family, in the sense of my mum used to go and take me to see my uncles and aunties, and I sort of had that connection to that heritage. And when you tell the story of how, when he died, you were charged with this amazing responsibility to take his ashes back to India, you, um, when I've seen you talk about it, you talk about it as though he, he did at least, if he didn't do very much else for you, he did at least introduce you to your Indianness. Yeah, so I, I hadn't, because I was raised by my mum and I didn't speak Hindi and I kind of resented my father, part of me always kept away from my Indianness. It wasn't something that I wanted to be because it reminded me of that. But I had to take his ashes to India to put them in a place called Haridwar, the River Ganges. Is that the source of the Ganges? It's just down from, so it's just where the Ganges leaves the Himalayas. Yeah. Uh, it's quite a remarkable place. Weirdly, it reminded me of Henley Royal Regatta. <laughs> Because which the river, couldn't be more English. Which couldn't be more English. The river's very straight. There's lots of bunting. There's lots of noise and people splashing uh -huh. about. Um, no dodgy blazers. So <laughs> that was arriving and seeing the place. And then I had to go and do this duty. My sister was with me. And supposedly you have to do it with the person's ashes. My dad's family are Hindu. You cremate um, when someone passes away. You put the ashes in the river Ganges so that their soul can move on to the next life and be reborn. And I hadn't wanted to do this. No, you'd put it off for about eight years, hadn't you? Yeah, yeah. And I hadn't, I hadn't wanted to do it because I was like, why should I take time out to go and do this for my dad? He wasn't a good dad to me. Why should I do something for him? But I went to go and do it. And it was slightly farcical because of the nature of somebody trying to say the ritual in Sanskrit, tell it to my cousin in Hindi, who then had to translate to me in English. I was just very confused and eventually got to the end and put the ashes in the river and it was transformational. We then got to the end, put the ashes in the river and then we had to go and do like this sort of admin. Yes. And it was there that I discovered this family tree going back 300 years. So every everybody had done this before you, in generations before you, they'd gone to there, they'd taken the ashes of their parent and then gone to fill in the forms, as you say. Yeah, so it's this thing that everyone has to do when their relative passes away. You have to take the ashes there, put it in, and then they go and do this admin afterwards, where you, you basically update the family tree, explain who came and who they came for. And I saw my dad's name, my, my, I saw the first time my name got written down in the book when my uncle had passed away. I saw the first time my dad's name got written down. I saw my grandfather's signature and my great-grandfather's signature, because they'd all come to do this for their parents or uncles. So it's not just the name of the person who's died, it's the family tree gets sort of updated. Exactly. So I updated it with all my nephews and nieces and cousins and looked back, and in this one place they had, they had it going back 300 years. My goodness. Remarkable, isn't it? And that's your family. That's my heritage, and suddenly, 
by doing this ritual that I'd kind of put off, discovering this heritage, I kind of felt a little bit Indian. Yeah. And it was sort of a thawing for me of my relationship with that side of my heritage and going out to discover it more and continue to travel more extensively around India. Yeah, well, that's where you come from, isn't it? You can see, you can see it in that family. How is that kept then? Is it rolled up in a scroll? And Yeah, so it's like, I mean, not too different from Stanford. So you've got the amazing shelves with these scrolls that are curled up and they look like snails almost. They're so tightly bound uh, and quite unexpectedly covered in fabrics like fake Burberry cloth. <laughs> um, I presume they change it every now and then. Yeah. And, yeah. Up and, you know, for me, that journey of healing really, it was a journey of healing. It was overcoming the legacy and I guess psychological trauma of being raised as the son of an alcoholic and... Uh, but your story is bigger than that, you see, isn't it? And overcoming that. Yeah. And, you know, I think making it a part of my life and then no longer having that resentment. I almost cast the resentment into the... Ganges, the Ganges. The ashes. Oh, I like the symbolism of that. Mm. And, and it's a, a heck of a place here to, to have that sort of story because you were just pointing at the books behind us. You've been to most of these places, <laughs> haven't you? It's incredible. And this, is, this place is so famous for maps. And, um, I mean, I don't know, do you work off a map or is it all now mobile phones? Absolutely not. Whenever I travel, whenever I go anywhere, whether it's around the UK using the Ordnance Survey maps or... And if these, I come to Stanford and buy a map because there's just something different about looking at a map. Mm. If you're looking at a phone, and I don't know if you ever find this driving when you're following um, navigation on your phone, you don't really know where you are. You just know how far you are yeah. from your destination. And it's the same with a phone. If you're just following a route on a phone, you, you, know, you shouldn't be doing it up a mountain because you could quite easily get lost. You don't know where you are. And if you're traveling somewhere, there's this feeling about when you open a map and... And the bigger they are, the better. You can almost get inside them, can't you? Exactly. Mm. It's so exciting. And the great thing about a map is you get the texture of the land. You can see, oh, now I know. What, I can see all the, all the villages are built in valleys. Why is that? That's quite hard to build on a mountainside, mm. rather than just points on a map linked by roads. So a place starts to make more sense when you look at it. through. So we started off asking why we travel. I'm not sure if we've completely answered it, but... So many people must sort of ask you for advice on where do I start, where do I get going, how do I start? Do you have any tips? It's so tempting when you're travelling to think about the destination first. But if you peel back the layers and ask somebody why are you travelling first, they will end up with a more fulfilling form of travel. Mm. Because if someone says, oh, where should I go in France? Thought, well, going to Paris for sightseeing is very different from going kayaking along the Loire Valley. And it's very different to going and discovering why Pinot Noir comes from mm. the Burgundy region. There's all these different things you can do. So if you understand, what do you want? Do you want to learn about the history and the, how that intersects with food? Then you can drive them towards Burgundy. If they want to just follow in the footsteps of Carrie Bradshaw, then they can go and do sightseeing in Paris. Understanding why you travel is the root of making travel fulfilling. So if you ask yourself, what am I trying to feel? What are the things that most affect me? And there's 12 reasons in the book, ranging from curiosity through to healing, through to hope. Mm. And just spending a bit of time thinking about that first, asking yourself a few questions, then you can start to find the place that matches that motivation rather than the other way around. And nowadays, there's not much limit, is there? I mean, you think of anything you've really always wanted to do, you can probably do it if you choose your moment right. I said, you have to take world politics and conflict into account sometimes. But I mean, where would you like to go next? I have really enjoyed in the last couple of years traveling Europe more. I think my where changes depending on the time. Mm -hmm. What do I need at that particular moment? At the moment, I feel like I need a mix of adventure plus exploring a story. And I'd like to go and spend some time traveling sort of Canadian, American, New England border, getting up into the mountains and the forests, looking at the stories of the First Nations people there, their intersection with the settlers, the colonialists, and a bit about the Revolutionary War. 
So I think it's telling that story, understanding the land and really exploring what indigenous culture means in that part of the world now. And now you've got a daughter, where would you really like to show Lyra first? We took her to New Zealand when she was four yeah, months. Yeah, you, like, you love New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, we've done that. I really want to do more walking around the UK with Lyra. I'd like to get her up into the mountains of Scotland. I would like to take her to Brecon Beacon, so I spent plenty of time as a soldier. I'll bet. And I would love, I'd really like to take her to Ukraine. Because if I can take Lara to Ukraine, it means I know that the war has been won by Ukraine and they've achieved peace. Yes. And I found it a beautiful place going into the east of the country, going into Donbass and seeing the valleys up there, going to the west up in the mountains. So I'd like to take her there because I know that it means Ukraine's got has achieved what it wants and deserves. Oh, that would be lovely too. It'd be a, that would be something, wouldn't it? I can tell. Um, I can tell why you called her Lyra too. I mean, there, there's a curious traveller for you, <laughs> and that, that's why you've called her Lyra, isn't it? Because of those northern lights, which you've only just recently seen. That's a very good point. I should definitely get her up to Norway and Svalbard mm. so she can meet some polar bears mm. and maybe make friends with I them. I think that's her destiny, don't you, with a name <laughs> like that. It's been brilliant, brilliant meeting you. I could go on talking with you all day, and I suppose most people could, but I know you've got to write the next book as well. <laughs> um, and I think Lyra might play a big part in your choice of uh, what you do with the next book. But for the moment, thank you so much. Thank you, that's utterly brilliant. Thank you. So there you have it, uh, another episode here on Viking TV with life, well lived to this point, and I'm sure with many more adventures to come. Um, until we meet again, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.